these are three places outside of the, the CC, which is, which is up there where the arrow is pointing at. This big green area is a huge hill above the CC, Mount Subasio. And up tucked into the side of that hill is this image on the right, which is a Eremo della Carceri, which is a retreat place that was used by the Benedictines who had been around already when Francis was living. They'd been around for 800 years, well, 700 years. Benedict was born in 480. And so from 500 on, there's a type of Benedictine monastic life developing and growing. Francis is around the year 1200. So that's 700 years after the year 500. And when he came, this, the Benedictines said, you can come and use this for your new movement and as a place of retreat. The place at the bottom was a church uh, down in the valley below Assisi, Rivo Torto. Francis lived there with his first followers. First, there were just two of them, Francis and two others. Then they slowly grew to a group of 12 and they went to Rome and they received the orders rule from Pope Benedict. And uh, there's another beautiful view. Uh, you can get there by foot, but it's uh, about two and a half mile walk up there. So it's kind of tiring. It's a very steep hill. So usually we take a taxi. Rivo Torto, you understand that Rivo Torto is the first place where Francis lived in community. First with two, then with 12. And uh, I think we have an image. That's such a beautiful picture. It's like uh, the scene of the peasants praying matins in the French painting. Mm. And uh, Francis lived here and developed his rule here. So this is sort of the first home of the Franciscan order. And that's, the, that's how the church is today. Church built in the 1800s. And that's the front door. And we're gonna go in and see replicas of the huts that Francis lived in in the first years of his life. That's Pope Francis visiting a couple of years ago when he visited Assisi. A couple of huts that the 12 brothers might have had there, replicas of them reconstructed, the church built over it. And it was from there in 1209 that Francis traveled to Rome, seven days walking, and this is an image from Giotto in the Upper Basilica in Assisi. Pope Innocent had a dream that a young man dressed in a simple robe was holding up a collapsing church. And the next day, Francis arrived in Rome, said, may I talk to you, Holy Father? And the guards said, no, you can't. You're just an unimportant pilgrim. And the Pope recognized him from the dream and uh, greeted him, says, come tell me what you want. He said, I want to present my rule to you, my rule of life, which was to live in poverty so that he could be free to concentrate entirely on preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And that was the sort of institutionalization of the Franciscan order and within another year, they moved over to Santa Maria degli Angeli and the Porziuncola, which is this church that also was a Benedictine church and it was also crumbling down. It's a, a key theme in this that the church was crumbling in the time of St. Francis and he was struggling to build it up. That's the basilica over the Porziuncola in this valley town of Santa Maria degli Angeli. And it but this is, again, as Bob was saying, inside that big church, um, the Porziuncola there we're looking at. Yeah, it's just uh, very interesting because uh, when Francis was at Rivo Torto, remember that he set up there, but effectively he's thrown out of there. And he moves to this very dilapidated place uh, of Santa Maria degli Angeli, Porzincolo, which is this little chapel, it means a small portion, and it's here really where Francis begins the, uh, the, the founding of the order. 
And uh, as we are going to see, particularly in this session today, it became a place that was very, very dear to him because he will want to be taken back to this very place to, uh, to spend the last moments okay, I think of I'm his back. life and die as well. Great to have you back. Uh, Bob. Welcome back, Bob. Hi. <laughs> so here we are in the Portziocola. Yes, we entered the chapel. church. Yes. Did you run and go get a cafe? <laughs> I just lost connection here. I don't know. There's an unstable connection. Mm. Uh, thank you for welcoming me back. Um, as Father Tony just said, this is where the order lived and grew. And during the years from about 1210 to 1220, when Francis was about 30 to about 40, during his 30s, the friars went to more than 5,000. From all over Europe, young men decided to join Francis and follow his evangelical lifestyle. So one of the great incidents of his preaching, famous was the preaching to the Sultan of the uh, Muslim world in Egypt. He first went to Acre and then crossed over and preached to the Sultan in the year 1219. He would have been almost 40 years old. This is an image which depicts his meeting with the Sultan. That's Francis in the middle, the Sultan with his arm outstretched. The fire is a fire that was burning there and Francis evidently so filled with fervor and courage said, I am willing to walk into that fire and prove that the God that I follow will protect me. If your fellow, uh, your fellow uh, imams or your Muslim preachers will also do so with me and none of them wanted to do it. And he never did walk into the fire, but the Sultan was so impressed with his, with his uh, spirit that he said, let's talk Tell me more about your life, your vision, your, your, your religion. And the Sultan and Francis engaged in a dialogue and he stayed several days with the Sultan. So this that, of course is the beautiful um, painting inside the Basilica of St. Francis that we're gonna enter into in a moment, Giotto. Um, I, I, I take it as a model of evangelization in the sense that he preaches and uh, he deals with the Sultan, but he doesn't give up his own faith. And he says to the Sultan, I have something so important to tell you about Jesus that, uh, that I'm willing to risk even offending you because you don't believe in Jesus, but I want to tell you about him. So I think being willing to be in dialogue, of course, but also retaining the evangelical spirit to preach Christ. The two things have to go together. This is this uh, scene of Francis preaching to the birds. Now we're back. He became known as the, the man who found in all creation the signs of God's presence. And this is why uh, Francis became the saint of the environmentalist movement. And again, we are all environmentalists. We love the environment as God gave it to us. We are stewards of this world and we shouldn't pollute it and we shouldn't destroy it and we shouldn't poison it for our children and grandchildren. And we all would agree with that, I think. But the, the world was given to us to tend, not to be worshiped. And uh, it's the holy God, the creator of the world, whom we worship. Well, finally, we reach the end of our summary of those other two hours, and we're now fully into new material. From the city of Rome, we are again going to Assisi, but now we are confronting the final days of the life of Francis, and his mystical identification with Jesus Christ. His whole life has been a journey toward Christ. Now he will go from Assisi up to Laverna in 1224 in the autumn, in September. It's such and a beautiful country. This is, if we were there, this is what we would see. 
It's just beautiful. Yeah. And that's the spot where that's that's the spot where Francis fasted and prayed for 40 days in imitation of Jesus in the desert, seeking to draw closer to God and to Jesus. And, and, on the, and of course, I'm amazed by this architecture. You see on the left side, they can build right on the edge of a cliff. It's extraordinary. And these, this is 800 years ago without, without modern technology they carefully built these structures. They used, of course, scaffolding as they built them. And then that was the spot where Francis experienced in his intense prayer, the thing that he had longed for all his life. We've got a message from Michael Sanchez, such a beautiful place and it is so beautiful and we have to go there. And we now have uh, about 120 people with us here and I think that would be a wonderful trip if we all traveled there together. Maybe in a yeah, it's really beautiful, uh, Bob. And I really, I'm just getting excited hearing that, that people want to get back to, to these places. I think that's great because that's the purpose of really these virtual pilgrimages uh, in this time of lockdown. It's just that Francis really loved to pray and he wanted to pray. There was a source to everything he did and it, he spent these long moments in prayer he used to call them a lent 40 days and in this particular moment where he's going to receive the stigmata uh, it was really to prepare for a meeting uh, really with saint michael the archangel you know, michael mass and uh, this is why it bridges the time of the feast of the exaltation of the cross the 14th of uh, september we think he received the stigmata around the 17th of September, but but really, it was in this moment of deep prayer, deep contemplation, that this winged creature, the seraph, came to him. Is that right, Bob? Yes. Now, again, on these particular points, we find ourselves on the edge of mystery. Some would say it was Christ himself who appeared as a seraph, or uh, mystically appeared, but we speak of the messenger, of course, angel means messenger. The angel of God is the messenger of God. And um, what an angel is, is a spiritual being, so it doesn't have material form or visibility. It's a power of holiness emanating from God, created by God. And we also speak of the Holy Spirit descending and, and, and like in Pentecost, we, we speak of it as tongues of fire that, that, uh, that stood above the heads of each of the apostles, disciples. So when we speak of God's dealings with men, the eternal divine spiritual with the temporal material human, we are crossing a barrier and we are dealing with mysterious things. So we can't, artists are sort of free to describe this as that. We're gonna see a couple of images of this seraph, but we now have our first writing in any of these pilgrimages. And uh, I've repeated this first line twice here. In Galatians 6, 7, the apostle Paul says, I bear on my body the marks. Greek stigmata, singular stigma, of Jesus. In medieval Catholicism, well, in the previous, let's go back again to the first, can we? These marks probably refer to scars, the results of the beatings and scourging Paul endured during his ministry. He was several times beaten. Paul implies that his scars are symbolic of the scourging Jesus had received at the crucifixion, which we recalled in the rosary today. Thus, sharing similar wounds or even a death by martyrdom for his sake was seen as a sign of supreme devotion and holiness. So this is this word stigmata. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Now, next slide. 
in medieval Catholicism, these stigmata or marks took on a more precise, more narrow meaning, referring specifically to the five holy wounds. What are the five wounds? Four wounds were caused by nails, the two hands and two feet. One wound was caused by a spear in his side. Jesus suffered on the cross from the nails in his hands and feet and the thrust of the lance into his side. Those are the five wounds. For the earliest Christians, the wounds in the resurrected Jesus, hands and side, were signs of the authenticity of re resurrection. You know, this is a, an incredible thing. Thomas, doubting Thomas, said, I won't believe that he's risen from the dead unless I put my finger into the wound. And Jesus said, okay, Thomas, put your finger in the wound. So, again, there's a great deal of matter for theological reflection on the fact that the risen Christ is still wounded, has the wounds. There are two, there are many different schools of thought, and we go on to the next. But the thought is that we will be raised in glorious bodies because it says in St. Paul tells us that we will re be raised in glorious bodies as if all of our wounds will be healed. But at the same time, we have this fact that the wounds remain. So the things that we have suffered in this life are never unsuffered, which is kind of, kind of striking and kind of supports the idea that this world, this reality we live in is a real reality that will always affect us. St. Francis of Assisi, 1181, 1226, was the first, the first of all the Christians to claim to have received these five holy wounds as stigmata on his own body. We've had many, I think several hundred cases since then. Someone could look that up and, and check that. On September 14th of 1224, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, St. Francis had a vision of Christ. I took this from a source, and he doesn't have a vision of an angel, but he has a vision of Christ on the cross, who, quote, gave him the gift of the five wounds. So this is what an artist, this this is the, it's Jesus there. Jesus holding out his hands. This is an artist's depiction of what happened to Francis after 40 days of praying. The wounds of the feet come to his feet. The wounds of the hands come to his hands. The wound from the side goes to the side of Francis. And the other one? This one is Giotto. And uh, however, I believe this is Giotto held in the Louvre in Paris. It's a second version because this is also depicted in the upper basilica in, in Assisi. Here we go. We have Robert Graff writing in all there are around 321, 321 generally accepted stigmata and 62 have been beatified. There Bob, as you're no... speaking, yeah, please, Bob, uh, as, as you're speaking, I mean, what you just said really stri struck me, those two images. I hadn't realized that before, you know, the two uh, Giotto images or these two paintings. One, you have Christ, the other, the seraph, really. And uh, I find that fascinating because in Francis really prayed for two things in his life. First of all, he prayed that he would experience the suffering that Christ endured on the cross. And secondly, he prayed for the ex to experience the love with which Jesus did that, you know, to experience the suffering and the love. And in those two paintings, I think the two are combined uh, because you have that suffering of Jesus. Yes, he really went on the cross he was crucified for us out of love for us but you also have this image of the seraph the seraph is angel close sister with wings are like on fire 
they're off the page. And that symbolizes the pattern of love for God. That love for God. It uh, really comes from that suffering as well of Jesus. And so Francis. Well, Bob, I think we lost Father Tony. I think he went out for a cup of coffee at the cafe. Oh. Am I? Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, I, again, my grandmother said, Harriet was her name, Harriet Moynihan. She said, offer it up, which means offer up your suffering. Each of us has suffering. Everyone listening has something they're suffering. My grandmother would say, offer it up. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't diminish your suffering but it gives your suffering some meaning. It transforms it from a dull and deadly pain. Oh, this is a third image. Uh, Ghirlandaio depicted this. He, he's also, uh, Ghirlandaio has, has uh, painted also in the Sistine Chapel alongside of Michelangelo. There's Francis in the middle and in, uh, you, you've got little angel, angel, baby angels, putti they call them. And in the middle, you have again Christ, a tiny Christ, if you can see it. I don't know if you can see it on a cross. And this is another version of how in the middle of the world, with animals and trees and birds, Francis in prayer confronts and is identified with the suffering and glorious Christ. Um, oh. Well, so now we're going to return to Assisi, Bob, mm -hmm. back from Laverna, and we're returning to the Basilica, and we, we end our three-part pilgrimage in Assisi in the Basilica of St. Francis. Yeah, and I was going to say something that I, I came across again on the question. I don't know, is Father Tony able to get I back am. with us? I'm back, I'm back with you, yep. Well, Father Tony, I, uh, I don't like Thank to put, I don't like to put you on the spot, but you've suffered in your life as, as I have and as Deb has, as everyone has suffered. And what I discovered is that suffering excavates your soul in a sense, makes it against your own will. It makes it deeper and wider so that you can be more kind and charitable towards the suffering neighbor. And uh, if you don't suffer, if everything is always pleasant, your soul can sadly become a little bit narcissistic or unexcavated. It's a strange phenomenon that the suffering becomes a gift. I hate to even say that because it seems shocking, but if we can transform it into a meaningful uh, spiritual ch chastisement in some way and learn from it, just uh, make this suffering be for me a cause of deeper wisdom, deeper love, deeper uh, charity towards my neighbor. Father Tony, does this make sense to you? <laughs> it does make sense, Bob, absolutely. Um, as you know, I mean, all of us, as you say, suffer. I'm a priest on the day of our ordination as priests when we receive the vessels for the Eucharist. Uh, the bishop handing us those vessels says, uh, model your life on the cross of Christ. And... Uh, that really has to become something very concrete for us in our lives. That's why St. Francis really speaks to me. As I said last week, you know, I was born with one hand and it was the thalidomide years. The doctors really advised my parents to have an abortion. They told me on the day of my ordination, what they told the doctors that if God has allowed us to conceive this child, God will have a mission. They only told me that on the day of my ordination. Wow. Uh, but what has really struck me in my life is this, which, by the way, is why I want to give my life looking after my mother in this moment. She defended my life in the womb. And now that she's vulnerable with Alzheimer's in this world, this culture of death, I really feel I want to defend her. But that, that aside, 
I can say to you, you know, I can preach till the cows come home. I can write all sorts of things, which are all good things. But I can tell you that when I say to people who are suffering, I too have suffered in my life because I only have one hand and they see it concretely that suffering that cross in my life. It means it breaks the ice. It changes everything. I'm not sure if you understand what I'm saying, but because I have suffered, then I enter, then people understand this person can understand my suffering. He's not just preaching to me. He's not just giving me theory, but he suffered in his flesh. And I really think that's what Francis, you know, when he received that stigmata, it wasn't something romantic. Padre Pio received the stigmata and he had gaping holes that bled. I mean, they literally, uh, they literally had that blood. They used to hold that blood in vessels. There was so much blood pouring out. And, um, but, the, but the point is, it's a suffering, as you said, that can be offered for the other. And so the, cry, the cross and that suffering becomes sweet. It actually becomes sweet in our lives because we know it's not wasted. We offer it up for others and they receive hope for, from us. You know, it's what St. Paul says, I fulfill what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Well, when you, when you cite that, you cite perhaps the most mysterious of all the passages of scripture. How is yeah. it, but I think it's important to meditate on, uh, Paul says that he offers up his own sufferings and each of us can do this for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Now we believe theologically nothing was lacking in the, the suffering of Christ. It was sufficient to save the world and to save the universe. The, the willed uh, acceptance of the cup, you know, I would prefer not to drink this cup, but thy will, not my will, be done. So Jesus goes willingly to his death. His disciples abandon him. They say they didn't even know him. He's alone. People are spitting at him, and he suffers. He's scourged. The rosary today was the mysteries of the suffering. And... Um, we believe that was sufficient for the salvation of the world because a perfect victim suffering willingly atones for all of the sin of the world. And yet Paul speaks of our suffering having meaning. It makes up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Paradoxical, but I, I find it consoling and I find it actually very important, extremely important that Paul says that our sufferings can be added to the sufferings that Jesus suffered in order to save the universe. So when we pass through physical problems, when you pass through Father Tony, the sorrow of, 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 your, of your hand, when I uh, or others have a, uh, suffer from, from, from tiredness or from some, some cold or some physical problem, we offer them up and they add to the sufferings that Jesus suffered to save the world. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and I, I think there's really something about that in the death of Francis as well. I think we're moving towards that, Bob. Yeah. Um, you know, towards the end of his life, he was really suffering physically. I mean, he nearly went blind. Um, he, he was in great pain, we are told, and, uh, and imagine he's begun an order with 5,000 people and uh, 5,000 followers, and his life is cut short, if you like. I mean, he's very young, isn't he? 46, is that correct? Uh, where, when he dies. But isn't it amazing, around, in those last moments of his death, he's actually encouraging his own brothers. I mean, he's suffering. But he's encouraging his own brothers to praise God. I mean, the canticle of the creatures and he adds sister death. He adds a, a line to that um, about welcoming death as well. But, he, but he's also real. Huh? He's also real. I just wanted to uh, 
read what what he says up there whilst I remember it. You know, he adds uh, that that line. He says, you know, we welcome death. We welcome death. He says, pray be praised, my Lord, through our sister bodily death, from whose embrace no living person can escape. But he also adds, I mean, that's beautiful, the praise of God. But he also adds, woe to those who die in mortal sin. Happy those she finds doing your most holy will. The second death can do no harm to them. I think that's just amazing, isn't it? Because he doesn't soft pedal. He does. Sometimes we're afraid to preach. Yeah, we preach joy. We preach uh, the good things of, of, of God. But 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 there's a reality. Uh, there is heaven and there is hell. That's the reality. Otherwise, that would make the coming of Jesus completely vain if there was no judgment at the end. Yes, we rely on his mercy, but there's also a justice to how we have lived our lives. You know, Father Tony, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a profound tradition in the Catholic faith that one of the greatest joys is a good death. One of the greatest blessings is a good death. Oh, and I forgot, we have Brother Leo over here. Why is there this other friar over here on the left of this painting? His brother Leo was staying with Francis, not far away from Francis, when he was praying and, and fasting for his 40 days. So Brother Leo was there, one of his first companions. This is the basilica that was then built for the body of Francis, the tomb of Francis. And we're going to go down to the tomb and say a prayer. But the, First, we're going to enter the lower basilica. Right. Uh, These are the and, front and, doors and of the basilica. The, the basilica, this beautiful basilica, has a beautiful crypt and then an upper basilica that was built years later. Um, so we're going to enter the lower basilica. And it is from this level that, of course, we go down further to the crypt where the tomb of St. Francis is. And we will go there at the very end where we can all be united mystically in together in that space in prayer to leave our desires and our prayers of our heart there. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Bob. On the on the left fresco there, to the left side, you have again the stigmata. That's the seraphim and Francis there. Receiving the stigmata. Do you see that? Okay, then now upstairs, up a stairway is the upper basilica. It's sort of made of color. Absolutely gorgeous. This is the great cycle of Giotto's paintings. And Giotto worked at in the late 12, in the 1290s and decorated this church with the scenes from the life of Francis. On the right side there, above where those two people are sitting, is the scene of the unrobing. That's the scene where he takes off his clothes and the bishop is behind him and Francis is giving his clothing back to his father. And the Bishop of Assisi likes this uh, particular fresco very much. He sees himself in that bishop protecting Francis. He's there to protect all the Franciscans of Assisi and also all the pilgrims if we get there. And uh, he, he feels that the creation of this special shrine or chapel in Assisi to commemorate this moment is an important thing. And uh, I agree with him, this disrobing. The, um, the earthquake in 1997 in Assisi, this central Italy is shaking uh, every few months, every few years. It's really shaking all the time. You, almost, you don't feel it except for every few years. In 1997, two people died. They were under this. This is the roof over the main altar. And you can see the fresco uh, uh, has been completely the the plaster has fallen down below and it fell down and killed two people so we can we can uh, think of them directly below that is this tomb of of saint francis this is where he's buried in the crypt and uh that's the moment when he passed away in uh 1226 down below in the valley next to the Porziuncola, his friars around him. He has to be laid, laid down on the ground. And um, looks like he's being lifted up here, but he's got the white 
chord where and the, uh, at, we, we decided that we ought to show the prayer of St. Francis, which is the prayer that each of you can uh, memorize <laughs> for our next meeting. We'll ask you if you've memorized it. Prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Father Tony, you can read the uh, second part. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it's in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. So now we go to the tomb and we'll have a moment of silence so we can pray. from the crucifix and then he lived his life attempting to do everything he could to build up the church in every way that he could to live a life of simplicity and poverty to not be distracted by the things of this world and then in the final 40 days of prayer he identified completely with Christ and became the first of all the Christians to be totally identified, even receiving the marks of the wounds of Christ. And two years later, dying and buried here at this spot. We say to the pilgrims when we come here, here we have Pope Francis when he was in Assisi and some of the friars around him. But we visit here, we can kneel in that same kneeler. We can say a prayer to St. Francis that we, mass uh, there. that we can we have celebrated mass there there's the altar but i would encourage anyone who has a pressing problem to entrust it to the intercession of saint francis at his tomb even in this virtual pilgrimage and ask that uh, some I think we may have lost Bob, is that correct? I think we may have, Father, so we'll just... Yeah, I just want to, um, yeah, a few moments, silent prayer, uh, Deb, and just some words, I think, just to tag on to what Bob every said. struggle. Some of the final yeah. words that Francis said before he died, I think, are very appropriate as we entrust that intention here now in our prayer. This is what Francis said, and it applies to each one of us to his brothers. Remain, my sons, in the fear of the Lord, and be with him always. And as temptations and trials beset you, blessed are those who persevere to the end in the life they have chosen. I am on my way to God, and I commend you all to his favor. St. Francis of Assisi, pray for us. <laughs>